strikes me that maybe the Hong Kong police force don't really know how to deal with the situation. What happens is you become an animal or you become your, your own worst enemy. Now, when the FBI tell you you didn't do anything wrong, don't say a word, just call your lawyer. <laughs>After Brazil turned down $22 million from the G7 nations to fight wildfires in the Amazon, President Jair Bolsonaro said today he's open to reconsidering taking the aid on one condition, that French President Emmanuel Macron apologize for calling him a liar and for disrespecting his country's sovereignty by treating Brazil like a colony. Johnson & Johnson may have been fined $572 million by an Oklahoma judge for its role in the state's opioid crisis, but today, the company's stocks were up. That's probably because the fine is much lower than what the state said it needed to deal with the crisis over the next 30 years. And given Johnson & Johnson earned $81.6 billion just last year, they'll barely feel it. Meek free, I'm not on probation no more, I don't have to go to court no more. Thank you, I appreciate that a lot. Rapper Meek Mill pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor gun charge in a Philadelphia court today, putting an end to a convoluted legal case that involves spending two years in prison while being on probation for 12, and inspired Mill to advocate for criminal justice reform. Federal prosecutors charged a former Google employee with 33 counts of stealing or attempting to steal trade secrets. The indictment alleges that months before Anthony Lewandowski left to start his own self-driving truck company, ultimately bought by Uber, he downloaded 14,000 files containing, quote, critical engineering information about Google's self-driving car program. If convicted, Lewandowski could face up to 10 years in prison. In a statement, his lawyer said he didn't steal anything from anyone. Hong Kong are now drawing guns on protesters. And on Sunday, for the first time since the movement started, an officer fired a live round. The police department defended him, saying his life was in, quote, grave danger. Police are finding it increasingly difficult to control the situation. Protesters started attacking the police vehicles. The police got out, pointed guns towards the protesters, and now they've had to, the police have had to flee away from the protesters up these stairs. You can see them gathering their breath and I'm assuming calling for backup. Three months of protests have changed the way that Hong Kongers live. This group of six self-proclaimed radicals moved out of their parents' homes and into a two-bedroom apartment. So how long have you been living here for? In this flat, it's just like one month. So during the protests? Yes, yes, yes. And why is it that you live here? Because like we would like discuss things about protests and also we got some like uh, defensive we uh, like weapons. If we put it at home, it'd not be safe. And also it's for our safety actually. Why is it that everything's shut up? The police will like come up and do search. Then we'll all be arrested because of those so-called weapons. Mm, so you're worried about neighbours reporting you yes. to the police and then yeah. the police coming here yeah. and arresting you for having weapons that yes. you say are defensive? Yes, yes, yes. That's why they wanted us to keep this location and their identities secret. The roommates balance full-time protests with part-time jobs and shift work. Can you show me around a little bit? Uh, actually, like, you can see <laughs> people here. There's people everywhere. Yeah. We got, actually, we got six person living here. Wow. And you must then, all sleep on top of each other. <laughs> and then we also got a dog. <laughs> yeah. Rick's parents don't know where he's staying and they worry about him. Have you had any injuries? Uh, the 12th of June, yes. Like, uh, then I get hit by the yep. police on the leg. Meanwhile, he's pulled together a war chest to defend himself. Oh my god, this is so much equipment. So show me what you're packing up in here. So basically I've been 
and motorbike armor in here in case of the radius mafia trying to chop people at least it can block some shop items and then uh, I have two masks and then fireproof gloves in case the police is going to use tear gas so this is the live feed of what's going on with the protests? Uh, yeah. What's the situation today? Uh, I think it's quite tense today, but we'll see later. Mm -hmm. For now, we're all getting ready to go out. OK. Not everyone will accept what we did, but for us, if we don't use radical ways to fight against the government, the government will still see us as nothing. If we lose this time, we totally lost. Like, we lost our freedom, and maybe Hong Kong will like totally establish back to China. Like, so why this time so many youngsters and also teenagers coming out and fight for their future? It's because it's our golden time. Police arrested 86 people this weekend, including a friend in Jen and Rick's group who were discovered with weapons. Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, said today that law enforcement will, quote, stamp out the violence. But some people who work for the police feel that both sides are partly responsible. I think we spoke to one community police officer who didn't want to share her identity because, just like the protesters, she's worried about being targeted. Is that fair though to blame the level of violence and what's happening here on the emotions of the protesters? Is it is part of that emotion not coming from the excessive force that's being used by the police at the moment? It strikes me that maybe the Hong Kong police force don't really know how to deal with the situation that they have in their hands, and that often they might panic. She fears that some of the protesters want a martyr. There's been a lot of violence this weekend towards the police. What do you make of that? I would say they deserve what they get. Do you not think that this level of violence is kind of undermining the whole protest movement and could kind of... I, I, don't, I don't think so. How is this all going to end? The changing point will be when people die because of the protest. Like either the protester or the police. Are you willing to die for this? I would say instead of ar arresting me, I would say better kill me. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg accepted an honorary degree yesterday. Just a few days after we learned that the 86-year-old was treated for pancreatic cancer. In spite of that, Ginsburg was her typical sharp, witty self. That's how it all began. She called it the notorious wow. RBG after the notorious B.I.G. Yes. President Trump is being delicate about the situation for now. I'm hoping she's going to be fine. She's pulled through a lot. She's strong, very tough. Now, if Ginsburg is forced to step down, Trump would get the chance to appoint his third Supreme Court justice after Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. More to the point, though, he'd get to move the court far to the right for a lifetime. 
That is a huge deal for conservatives, and they're ready for it. There's a list of replacements ready to go, put together for Trump by Leonard Leo, vice president of the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation. The list was the brainchild of former White House counsel Don McGahn, who was looking for a way during the 2016 campaign to reassure social conservatives that Trump would be a reliable ally in the White House. So the list only includes reliably conservative judges. It's pretty homogenous. Of the 24 people on the list, 21 are white, in addition to one black judge, one Latino, and one South Asian. 19 of the 24 are men. The nominees are also relatively young for potential Supreme Court justices. 15 of them are 55 or younger. Trump's nominee will almost certainly be one of them, given that conservatives want to ensure any pick stays on the bench for a long time to come. So who's at the top of the justice watch list? There are three candidates that Trump interviewed after Anthony Kennedy stepped down, and they're often talked about as having an inside track to the nomination. Raymond Kethledge, a circuit court judge from Michigan, has a reputation as having a great legal mind, and he's been a leading advocate of reigning in the power of independent federal agencies, a very important issue for conservatives. Amal Thapar is from Mitch McConnell's home state of Kentucky, which would smooth his path to confirmation. He'd be the first South Asian on the court and has a decidedly conservative record on issues concerning money and politics and sentencing policies. But that stuff isn't really the holy grail for many conservatives. Overturning Roe versus Wade is. Would you agree that Roe v. Wade is long established and well accepted precedent? Yes, Senator, I will. Ought not to be disturbed as a matter of stare decisive. Senator, I will follow the law and you will never have reason to say I didn't follow the law. The anti-Roe crowd probably has their eye on a third potential nominee, 47-year-old Amy Coney Barrett, a former Notre Dame law professor whom Trump made a circuit court judge in 2017. Barrett checks all the boxes. She's young and she's a favorite of conservative activists because of her unabashed Catholicism. When you read your speeches, um, the conclusion one draws is that the dogma lives loudly within you. And that's of concern. But Barrett doesn't just stand out because of her faith. She's written in the past that a Supreme Court justice can dump precedent when she thinks it's in conflict with the Constitution, meaning she probably wouldn't be afraid to go after Roe. Her second ace is that she's a woman, and having her lead the fight against Roe might help counter liberal outrage over a bunch of white men going after women's rights. Barrett would still have a lot of hurdles to get over. She's 180 degrees from the activist left on basically every social issue, and the mobilization against her would be intense. But putting her on the court would be social conservatives' best shot at their most cherished goal. And that would make Barrett a hard choice to resist. I don't know what I'm going to do when I'm going home. I, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say I got it all together. I don't know if I got it together or not. I might explode one Jabbar Currents was an inmate for nearly 11 years at ADX Florence, the most secure prison in the United States. He landed there after attacking guards at another federal prison. I think what I'm most concerned about is just snapping one day. Just going off. And just, you know, just losing it. And he did. Three days after his February release, Currents sexually assaulted a woman in a park. He was convicted on four charges and currently faces up to eight years for the attack, but could get 20 to life if convicted of a fifth charge. EDX Florence is home to notorious criminals like a 9-11 plotter, Zakaras Musawi, and El Chapo. All inmates are kept in solitary confinement. Some can only leave their cells to exercise alone or in small cages outdoors. But most prisoners at ADX are not infamous criminals, and only about 40% have life sentences. Okay. Currents says his time at ADX exacerbated his mental illnesses. I got borderline personality disorder, schizoaffective disorder, a cyclical mood disorder, bipolar, antisocial personality disorder. Since 2015, there were at least three other cases where prisoners released from ADX committed serious crimes. We spoke with 11 former inmates. Some are living happy and productive lives. 
Others say their time in Supermax made them even more aggressive. This made me angry, real angry, that I was knocked down like that and isolated like that. Ed Arrow is a lawyer who represented 18 ADX inmates in a class action lawsuit filed against the Bureau of Prisons in 2012. Everything here is inmate. What we found was a prison that was full of people who were, many of whom were catastrophically mentally ill and who were receiving little, if any, uh, treatment of any kind. The suit alleged that the BOP violated its own standards by keeping mentally ill prisoners in severe and isolating conditions. One inmate drilled a hole in his forehead. Another ate his own feces. Several died by suicide, according to the lawsuit. When you house somebody at a place like the ADX for years, which we know damages them in a lot of different ways, we owe them the opportunity, a reasonable opportunity to decompress and slowly relearn how to function the way that society expects people to function. The BOP did not admit wrongdoing, but settled the lawsuit in 2016, agreeing to offer group therapy, more time out of the cells, and other reforms. These are my rods. One of the inmates Arrow met at ADX was Rodney Jones, who spent eight years at the Supermax after assaulting inmates at another federal prison. He was released in 2011. Three months prior to me going home, I actually was returning from being in the hospital for a week for an attempted suicide. I didn't know what to expect when I got out. I was scared. It was about 5.30 in the morning. They took me out of my cell, put me in a van, and we drove. My time was up, but I'm still in shackles leg irons, and, 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 and belly chain. I'm a free man, though. They, they dropped me off at uh, Union Station. But, you know, I'm looking, and it's all new to me. So they take the, the lock off, take the thing off. They give me, this, they give me my, my paperwork, and they tell me I can go. I don't know where to go. The idea that they would chain him up and put him in the back of a van and drive him across the country struck me as crazy. If he's too dangerous to be unrestrained in a van with two trained correctional officers, what does that tell you about the mindset of the Bureau of Prisons? Jones says he wasn't prepared for life on the outside. Because I was living with my mom. She, you know, she had given me a room in the basement, and I would wake up. We're waiting for somebody to bring me breakfast when all I had to do was walk upstairs and fix my own breakfast. My mom has a, a patio like this, but I would be afraid to go out there. Like, I would be like, am I allowed to go out that door? The ex-prisoners who have succeeded say the key is having a strong support network, stable housing, and a steady job. Me and my wife, we grew up on the same street. We knew each other when we were kids. And one of the first people that I saw on Facebook was her. I was headed back down that road to destruction because, mind you, I had already, on several occasions before marrying her, I had thought about suicide. Lift your rod up, lift it up, get it in. For him to survive that and come out and find a woman of his dreams, <laughs> get married, you know, move into a house, you know, and stuff like that, and work. God kept him for a reason. He got <laughs> She went in there and got hers. <laughs> Inspectors who visited ADX in 2017 found that around 50 inmates were scheduled for release by 2020. In a statement to Vice News, the BOP said they avoid releasing inmates directly from restrictive housing back to the community, and that when necessary, they provide targeted re-entry programming to prepare the inmate for his return to the community. Former inmates say small changes to how they're prepared for life after prison won't be enough. Reforms have to be made at every level. I want people to take away how a system, basically, that I've been dealing with my whole life, 
failed me from, from 10 years old from now. That system basically just depersonalized me and made me into a thing. And then what happens is you become an animal or you become your, your own worst enemy. The cause painting here, SpongeBob SquarePants, I believe he's called. Art sales and auctions have been breaking records. At 850, no, and your bids over the round of applause. In some cases, collectors spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a single piece. $400 million is the bid, and the piece is sold. And with all that money at stake, many of these collectors pay for forensic and expert testing to ensure they're getting the real deal. That's because where there's money, there are scammers. Right in here. Right in here. You gotta get right in there. Ken Perini knows a thing or two about forging art. He's been doing it for decades. That is, until 1998, when the FBI began a five-year investigation into Ken. See the... Modern paintings take a different type of aging than an antique painting. He had passed off his forgeries of 19th century artists in major international auction houses. Two FBI men walked in that door. What was your explanation? I simply told him that I was very lucky at finding them in, uh, in flea markets. Did you have your buttersworths hanging all over the house? Luckily, no. As they no. asked you how you got all these Luckily, buttersworths? Luckily, no. Uh, but if they would have opened the door back there, they would have said, <laughs> we've just hit the jackpot. He perfected imitations of James E. Buttersworth, a 19th century English painter. The five-year investigation dried up, and Ken is now safely past the statute of limitations on his crimes. How many people have fakes of yours? Let's, let's just take the Buttersworth, for example. Yeah. <clears throat> How many people have this in their home and think they have a Buttersworth original? Well, it's hard to say. I've painted so many of them through the years, but put it this way, every so often one turns up in a magazine or a catalog and it's like bumping into an old friend. So what motivates someone to forge art? I didn't plan to become an art forger. It kind of like happened by default. And I found that I had a hidden talent for it. And it gave me a very exciting life in a very quick way. I liked the money. I spent a lot of money. When I had a good sale, I would go out to Ireland, stay at castle hotels, horseback riding, read books, go to a lot of fancy restaurants. The, the life it gave me was something um, that I, I would not otherwise have had. This could be a great fake right here. Really great fake, completely original composition. Today, instead of selling his work under another artist's name, he legally sells authentic reproductions to people who want high art without the high prices. The irony of the situation is I'm doing better now than I ever did in the old days because I could sell so many more and, and, and times have changed so I could get a whole lot more, even as fakes. How do you and label your paintings now? I don't. I have people that... Uh, want me to sign my own name on my fakes, and I refuse to do that because for me to put Ken Perini on that Buttersworth would um, compromise the integrity of the fake. Uh, uh, that, that's a, that, well, that sentence is compromise the integrity of the fake. Right. If you were starting out right yeah. now, yeah. do you think you could have the same career that you had? I think I could, yeah. In spite of the scrutiny today, um, I could see many areas where you could stay under the radar. Forgers follow trends, and trends go hot and cold. Lot number 5A is the Kerry James Marshall. Today, Canada interest in black artists who used to be ignored by the elite art world has shot up, thanks to record-setting sales like P. Diddy's $21 million purchase of a Kerry James Marshall painting. Early this year, some New York gallerists warned that they were seeing more forgeries and fakes of black artists' work. 
Some galleries in New York have recently said that there's been a rise in fakes around black American artists' mm -hmm. work. Artists who are working in the 20th century right. and maybe now have passed. Mm -hmm. Why would that be? Newly appreciating artists are particular targets, especially if they're being introduced into the sales rooms. When you buy something in an auction house, it has now graduated to an entirely new level of investment quality. So when you get in on the ground floor of something that's rapidly appreciating, uh, there isn't that much expertise there. That's a prime target, that got a bullseye on it. Let's just go and exploit that. Do you think that the victimology or the hurt is any different in the case of black American artists? Yeah. So if someone is going out and forging their work now, right. or changing their legacy, just as their legacy is starting to get right. some attention, right. yeah. does that change your perspective on sort of who gets hurt by this and what it means to forge? Personally, I wouldn't do it. Imitation is the greatest form of flattery. The artist that I targeted in 99% of all cases were long dead, but I feel that I paid a tribute to them. I, I say my work speaks for itself. You could take whatever position you want, and I will go on creating these pictures for many more years to come, and where those paintings will be 20 or 30 years from now is anybody's guess.